What's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning back in today. Appreciate you watching the channel. Uh, we have hit the 300 subscriber mark, and thanks to everyone for that. Appreciate it. Shout out to Addy uh, for being the 300 subscriber. Appreciate it. Uh, today, I want to talk about the Mark of the Beast and give you some thoughts. I'm going to give you some different thoughts than I've given you before. Um, some of them will be the same. So if you've watched the previous video, then um, some of this will be reviewed, but there will be some new stuff in it as well. So I hope you'll think about it and consider it. There's a pretty strong preterism pushback that's going on right now and uh, that's okay I understand it because I I felt the same thing uh, but uh, it's at least going to force us to study so I pray that people will study and um, that God will reveal the light to us and um, just show us what the truth of his word is so when we think about the mark of the beast there is between the left behind movies and Tim LaHaye's books and um all of that, there is an extreme um, profitability that has been made on it. Um, it really does amaze me, just kind of the, the nature and the character of um, really what this has done to folks and, and the thoughts. And um, I'm sure if, if you've been around Christianity for very long and you've had conversations with people about, is this, you know, something that's, you know, is it this COVID shot? Is it, um, you know, whatever. All kind of stuff, and I think we need to ground this biblically and understand the way that Scripture interprets Scripture and uses this in a certain context and in a certain framework. Now, what I'm fixing to teach you is that this event happened in the past, which agrees with many scholars, but um, I think this is an applicable thing to all of life, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. I want to start out reading in Revelation 13. I'll start in verse 15. That's You can go back and read the whole chapter. I don't want to read the whole thing, but we'll at least give some background as to you know where this whole mantra takes on this life of its own. Revelation 13, 15 says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. This is the second beast. Granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, uh, free and slave, to have to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So question number one, is this um, a man? Is this uh, an entity? What do you do with this? And I think most people, if you are familiar with Nikolai Carpathia and the Left Behind movies and Kirk Cameron, then you associate the 666 with him. If you put this in the past, which a lot of folks do, then I think that most people associate this with Emperor Nero, and they would get there using... Uh, uh, gematria, which is a method of interpreting Hebrew scriptures based on adding up the numeric value of letters. So this letter stands for a certain value. You add it all up. It comes to 666. They would make a strong case and say, look, this is not saying 666, but this is saying 666. I don't have any issue with saying that this is a reference to Nero. However, I'm also saying that this beast reference is more general to Rome itself. Um, and I would say that Rome itself being backed by Satan. So essentially what you have with the mark of the beast, no matter when you put the timing, whether you put it in the past, whether you take an idealist approach to it and say well, it's for then and now and everywhere, which I don't have a problem doing that. But I think specifically this passage is speaking of something that's in our past or if you place it in the future. You can boil this down to two things. This is either worship of God or worship of Satan. And then there's an entity that represents um, Satan, which would be this beast. I don't have an issue saying that the beast in general is Rome, yet it's represented by Nero. And you say, well, why do you do that? How do, how do you not have that issue? Well, Daniel in Daniel's four kingdoms, most scholars agree that the very first one is Babylon, which I agree with as well. But I want you to notice what Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar when he's interpreting his dream in Daniel 2, 37 uh, to 38. He tells him, 
um, that you, Nebuchadnezzar, are this head of gold. So he identifies this head of this beast with Nebuchadnezzar. So it's not a stretch to say that the leader of the people can be identified as the representative of that people, meaning that since Nebuchadnezzar can be the head of gold, the beast, then when the fourth kingdom, Rome, comes, then Nero, who is the emperor at that time, at the time the book of Revelation was written, then he can be the representative head. Now, if we think about all the beastly things that happen in the Bible, it's interesting to take note on the sixes and their association with the beast, which I think at the end of the day, again, represents not just the person as to who it is, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Babylon or Nero and Rome. I, I think this is the ultimate pointing to Satan. And it's really interesting to find out all the sixes that we see. I want you to notice Daniel 3.1, Nebuchadnezzar's image that he built says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So six is associated with Nebuchadnezzar. Let me think about Goliath just for a second. Um, Goliath is this enemy that no man could uh, defeat. I think this representative of um, Satan. And then all of a sudden God raises up a leader who he's anointed, who's going to come out and defeat this enemy. David being a picture of Christ. Sorry if that ruins your childhood and how you grew up thinking about um, David and Goliath. First Samuel 17, 4 to 7 says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. Coat of mail is scaled armor. He dressed him like a beast, and his height was six cubits in a span. Weight of his coat was 5,000 shackles of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs, and Bronze javelin between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. So six is associated with Goliath. Six is associated with Nebuchadnezzar's image. Solomon begins to rule like a worldly king, not like God's king. Takes in too much uh, land, money, women, all kind of stuff. And in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14, listen to how Solomon was described. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. What you have in this mark of the beast and these numbers of these sixes, 666, representative, are we worshiping God? Are we worshiping something else? State of gov status government uh, or a person which ultimately leads to the worship of Satan, which is not the worship of God. So let's talk about the mark specifically. Is it a literal mark? Is it a literal mark? You're saying this was in the first century where they literally walking around with a mark on their uh, wrist in the middle of their forehead, the frontlets between their eyes, or was this symbolic? I know plenty of people who put this in the past. I shouldn't say plenty. I know some people who put this in the past that think this is a literal mark. I'm not on that train. I think this is a symbolic mark. Let me show you a little bit about why I think that. When we understand that the book of Revelation is uh, presenting the covenant cursings of Deuteronomy 28 to 32, we understand this in light of Israel's context, and we can understand some other New Testament passages that tie this to us as well. But I want to start you back um, in Deuteronomy 6. The people of God, Israel, are supposed to worship him and him alone. Uh, let me read you some of the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Now listen to this. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, the law of God, and as frontlets between your eyes. Now let me ask a question. Did the Jewish people literally walk around with the law? on their wrist and on their forehead and the answer i believe to that would be no so what's it representing well with your hands you work who are you working for the lord or for someone else with your head you think and you worship who do you worship the lord or someone else you remember when jesus was on trial remember what the jews shouted we have no king but caesar that's worship of someone other than God. I think that's the idea of the mark of the beast. So worshiping some 
other than the Lord. And I want you to notice something in Revelation 13, 12. It says this um, in Revelation 13, 12 about who I believe this beast, um, this smaller beast, apostate Israel, leading people to worship the other beast who I take as Rome. It says, and he exercises all authority of the first beast, apostate Israel, the first beast being Rome. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. See the connection? That's exactly what Israel was doing. They're, they're unconcerned about worshiping Yahweh. They're more concerned about their status and their power and their prowess. And that is tied directly to Rome. I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a second. Revelation 17 tells us that the woman was dependent upon the beast. Just go read it. And I think you can start probably about verse seven, Revelation 17, seven and read down. It'll tell you that this woman apostate Israel was dependent upon this beast, Rome, that she was sitting on. Uh, Israel is the harlot in Revelation. Listen to John 11, 47 to 50. It says this, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man, Jesus, works many signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. See the connections? Let's don't disconnect the book of Revelation from the rest of the Bible, please. It, it doesn't do us any good to do that. Scripture interprets Scripture. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. He didn't know what he was predicting there, but that's exactly what happened. So if we take this as a thought of worship of status government, which essentially leads us to worship of someone other than God, then I think we can apply this not just to our life. Think about how many people are more dependent upon nationalistic parties than we are upon the Lord. That's all over our culture. If we can apply this to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar said? You're going to, all these sixes in this beast that he built in Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you bow down and worship this image. Essentially, you could say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being forced to take the mark of the beast by worshiping that image. Well, what did they not do? They didn't worship the image. What happened? God, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown in the fire. That's the same picture as the martyrs in the New Testament in the first century. Who's going to be able to stand? Well, some of those died during the tribulation. Uh, those who believed in Jesus. But then those martyrs were avenged, Revelation 6, whenever the coming of the Lord uh, through the Roman army happened to Jerusalem in AD 70. So you could make the same case. But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were raised out of that fire, so too those who believed in Christ Jesus are raised to eternal life. And that's the glorious picture in the continuity, that even though it's worth it for us to say, look, we love the Lord Jesus. We're not worshiping anybody else. We're not taking any kind of mark. Uh, our work on our hand is going to be for him. Our worship of our head is going to be for him. That's what the Jews did and the Christians did in the first century. I believe Gentiles were being persecuted too. So um, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't take the mark. Same concept. And we have the same um, specific thing that's addressed to us today. Now, uh, we're not being persecuted to the point of where we're being killed in our country in America, but the same concepts are true. And I think it's a fallacy to say that just because this happened in the past, that's not a um, something that's a, a reality for us, a spiritual reality and, and a decision and a question that we have to go with and, and choose. Revelation 13, 17 says this. It says that those who took the mark couldn't buy or sell unless they worship the beast. Now, with that in mind, I want you to consider something that Paul is doing all throughout the New Testament. I want to read you a couple of verses and you just see if you can think about this. If you're in Jerusalem, what's happening to those Christians who are professing faith in Jesus Christ? History tells us about Nicodemus and his family, how they were banished from the city. And I think this was happening to those who were in Jerusalem. They were being disowned from the society. And it says, unless they took the mark of the beast in Revelation 17, or 13, 17, that they couldn't buy or sell or essentially have any part in the commerce that was going on. So when Paul's on his missionary journeys, listen to some of these verses. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4 says this. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. 
On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he uh, may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. Paul's taking up money to bring it back to Jerusalem. Second Corinthians 8 and 9 are the whole basis for what we know as giving uh, under the new covenant. And I don't know where you're at on tithe or not tithe. I don't, I'm an, I say no tithe. I think that's connected to the old covenant system that's passed away. But nonetheless, the New Testament teaches that we should give and, and give for the glory of God. Uh, and I'm probably not as strict on people about that. Like, look, look I'm at a, I'm at a small church. I'm not at a mega church where we're teaching people to tithe because we're all making a killing around here. Okay. That's not happening. Um, but just out of be gracious with things like that. So that's a complete side note. Sorry. But second Corinthians eight and nine are the basis for our giving. And Paul tells us that the giving should uh, be of the abundance of the heart and our love for the Lord. Well, it's not disconnected. He's talking to the same people that he was in first Corinthians 16, one to four, when he gets to second Corinthians eight and nine. So this foundation for this giving and this basis, I believe, has its root not just to teach us principles today, which it does, but he's extolling them to give, hey, look, I've got to go back to Jerusalem and we're going to need to take some money back to these folks because they're being banished out of that society because the Jewish people are kicking them out because they're not worshiping, because they're worshiping Jesus Christ. And those Jewish people are essentially dependent upon Rome, worshiping the beast. See the connections? It's all there. Romans 15, 25 to 27, Paul said, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Well, why are the saints poor in Jerusalem? They're kicked out of society. It pleased them indeed, and they are debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, notice our spiritual blessings are con connected to Israel uh, because they're the ones who brought forth the Messiah. He says, if our spiritual blessings um, come from them, their duty is also to minister to them. The Gentiles' duty was to minister to them in material things because they couldn't uh, buy or sell or trade or things of that nature. All those connections are made and it's beautiful. Let me give you one more and I'll stop. Acts 24, 17, Paul said he's on trial. It's, I don't remember which number of trial this is. This is two or one. I think he's before, I don't even want to guess. He appeared before Festus once, Felix once, and the Jewish leaders, so Whichever one this is, he's given his testimony and he's telling about the time when he was on his missionary journeys and then he came back to Jerusalem. So Acts 24, 17 says, after many years, I came to bring alms and offering to my nation. Who's Paul's nation? The Jews in Jerusalem. So after his journeys, he brought it back and they hounded his steps. You might remember from, I believe it was Ephesus. They hounded him and they put him on trial and he winds up getting carried all the way to Rome to appear before Caesar. So if we connect some of those things together, I think it helps us to understand the mark of the beast and uh, the negative effects that it had specifically on those Jews in um, Jerusalem in the first century. Helps us to understand why Paul was bringing these offerings back to them. Helps us to understand the nature of the mark of the beast. I don't think it was literal. I think it was a spiritual representation of worship and who they were worshiping. I think that can be applied throughout the Bible and throughout us today. I hope this video helped you uh, at least give you some thoughts on it. And maybe if you've never heard a different take on it, I, I hope that appeared gracious to you. I'm Look, I'm not 100% dogmatic on certain things. I am 100% sure and convinced of me, uh, for me, that this is essentially something that le that is about worship. The whole thought behind this mark of the beast is we're worshiping God or we're worshiping somebody else. So whenever you put that, that's fine. But you're going to come to that conclusion no matter what timing you have on it. And I pray that's a blessing to you. And I pray that when you read the book of Revelation, that you won't read it in a vacuum, that you'll connect it to the rest of the Bible and the scriptures and see how it plays together. See how it's borrowing off the rest of the Bible. And... Um, yeah, that's it. So thanks for watching. I, I pray that you'll uh, keep watching. I hope this is a, a ministry that's a blessing to you. Listen, I, I don't respond to every comment that's down below, um, especially those who are negative against me. Look, I, I'm not opposed to anybody being negative or against me. That's fine. I just don't have a whole lot of time in my life to, to argue with people on the internet. And I don't think that everybody who comments something that's against what I'm saying 
is uh, trying to argue with me. So please don't take it that way. I, I see what you're saying. I, I, I'm reading it. I got you. Um, we had a uh, a really good comment last time. I believe I don't remember the name. I think it was Chewy, and I don't remember the number. But it was a good comment about the land, and it was in the land video when they were selling the land that was in Jerusalem. And he said so much for the land promises that people want to tie to the physical land. And I thought that was a really good point. So I appreciate it. You guys, like, comment down below. Tell me what I missed. Add some thoughts to me here. I learned from you guys as much as you learned from me. So um, leave them in the comments and look forward to seeing you again, hopefully toward the end of this week. Uh, God bless and have a great day.